Some of the most undervalued experiments, like ever, were Avery McLeod and McCarty's 1944 experiments that basically showed that DNA was the source of genetic information, but no one believed them. It wasn't until like eight years later with the Hershey Chase experiments that people were finally kind of opening up to this idea that DNA could be the source of genetic information. People had just thought that proteins were so much more likely to be the source of genetic information than DNA that they just weren't ready to accept it. Plus, Avery et al.'s experiments didn't have the cool blender factor. We'll go into way more detail about all the findings and go through the actual paper figures. But basically, they were building upon the findings of Frederick Griffith in 1928. He had found that there was this like transforming substance that was able to transform transform a non-virulent, so like non-disease causing strain of bacteria into a virulent, so disease causing one. So he could take bacteria that were heat killed, but from the virulent strand, so from this like S strain. And so the S comes from when he grew it in culture, it made this, it had this smooth appearance that's due to this um, polysaccharide, so this like sugary coat that it has. And this is in, um, this is opposite of the R, like the R, the R form, and the R form is all rough and it doesn't have that nice smooth coat. It also doesn't cause the disease. He could take the S form that had been heat killed and this could not cause any disease, but when he mixed it with live R, which also couldn't cause any disease, the live R like transformed into the S form. So it got that smooth appearance and it killed the mice. So he was able to show that this S, something in this S form could like transform the R form into the S form. And so he was showing that there was something here that was so source of this genetic information, the source of capable of holding the instructions for how to make this S form. And so he, but he didn't know what it was. And so the work of Avery McLeod and McCartney really went about saying, okay, what, 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 what is that transforming substance? What is the thing with the genetic information? And the way that they did this was by adding very, was isolating the thing that it was so they isolated the DNA but they didn't know it was DNA yet they suspected it was DNA but they had to really 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 prove that it was DNA and still people didn't believe them but basically they added all sorts of things they added um, various things that chewed up DNA things that chewed up RNA things that chewed up protein things that chewed up fats so they added all these things and only when they added things that actually chewed up the dna did they see a loss in the transforming activity and they did some other experiments to try to further characterize it so that the chemical identity was like what you would expect for dna all of these various things and it's some really really cool experiments some really classic um really really elegant experiments and a very um nice to read paper um so it's free to read and we'll go through some of the paper figures and that sort of thing but i highly encourage you to read it yourself a lot of these older papers they actually i find them a lot easier to read than the newer papers um there's a lot um they tend to describe things in a lot more terms and a lot more detail and things so for someone who really loves details i am like all over it okay so let's dive in I'm gonna start with the caveat that I'm not a microbiologist, I'm a biochemist, so hopefully I don't mess up with the terminology too bad with strains and types and forms and various things. But the key thing is that in Griffith's experiment, he was studying this pneumococcus bacteria. And this bacteria can have these different types. And so it can have like type one, type two, type three. And then these types can have these different forms. So they can have this S form and this R form. This S form, it gets its name S because it forms these smooth colonies. And it does this because it has a polycapside, polysaccharide capsule. So poly many saccharide sugar. So it's encapsulated in this sugary coat. It's going to make it form these smooth colonies. And it's also going to allow it to be virulent. So to cause disease. And so it can cause disease that can kill mice. This R form doesn't have the capsule and it forms these rough colonies, with this rough appearance. It can't cause disease, it's not virulent, and thus it spares the mice. But what Griffith found was that there was a transforming principle that could turn R into S. So basically there was something in the S that could turn the 
um, turn the R into live S and live S of a different type as we'll get into. So he could take this heat killed S and he could mix it with this live R. Neither of these on their own could cause disease, but the S was able to transfer something to the R that was able to transform the R into S and kill the mouse. And it's not just transforming it from the R to the S, it's transforming it to a different type. And I, I'm going into this because it's a kind of crucial distinction because people had known that you could actually go from like the, you could go between these forms. So the S form could spontaneously like revert into this R form, but within a type. So how so if you were to grow this S form for a long time in culture, then it could actually you would get revertance into you would get strains that would actually transform back into this like R form. But this isn't really like a transformation. This is just the change within the type. And so in order to really show that. So people knew that you, that that the bacteria could do that, but they didn't know was that you could actually transform types from one type to another. So one type, so a type two or a type one isn't just going to spontaneously transform into a type three, but um, Griffith showed that you can actually get these to transform into a type three if you give them something from the type three S. And so there was something in here that was able to provide the genetic information needed to make that type three stuff and make this a, um, and kill this mouse. So he was able to distinguish between this and be able to tell the, show that the type was changing because these types have different um, like reactogenicity with, with antigen. With, and he was able to tell between these types and show that the types were actually changing based on this like agglutination strategy with antibodies against the different types. So let me tell, um, go into what I mean. So this is a lot like the... Um, this is a lot like blood typing and why we can't just like mix blood types willy nilly. So blood types come from, we have these different genes and they're gonna make us have different sugars um, on our blood cells. So different people have different combinations of the genes for these various antigens. And so these are going to be these sugars that are going to stick off of cells. So an antigen is actually something that binds to an antibody. Um, so antibodies are just these little proteins and they have these binding sites for various antigens. Different antibodies will recognize different antigens and then um, they can cause like an immune response and stuff in your bodies. And in a tube, a test tube, what they're gonna cause is agglutination. So if there are antibodies that recognize a various antigen, then they're going to stick to that and cause it to clump up. And so when it comes to blood types, we, since people have different sugars on their blood types, they're not going to have antibodies that recognize their own blood because those antibodies would be selected against because you wouldn't want to be attacking your own blood. But if someone else's blood comes in and they have different antigens, so they have different blood types and they have different sugars on their blood, if our blood, if our body's not used to seeing that sugar, we might have antibodies that could attack it. And so this is how you can blood type by like mixing the blood with, um, with blood types of blood with various antibodies and seeing if the blood is going to clump up, if it's going to agglutinate. And so when it clumps up, you can see that you can like see that this has changed. And so this is the strategy that Avery et al is going to use. They're going to use this clumpiness as well as the difference in the colony shape. So they're not going to deal with mice which is nice um, in terms of reading the paper and everything. Um, so, but this is what the situation that Avery et al is going into. So they know that there is this transforming principle, but they don't know what it is. And so Griffith's works were transformative, um, pun intended, um, but they didn't, he didn't show like what this actually was. Whereas Avery, McLeod and McCartney, McCarty, um, they actually show what it is, but people don't really think it's enough proof yet. Um, people weren't ready to accept the fact that this um, that DNA could could be the source of genetic information because it only has like these four letters, whereas proteins have like twenty and they have way more versatility than DNA. Um, and but now we know, of course, that DNA is the source of the genetic information. Before I forget, I'm going to be talking, uh, and I have been talking in terms of last names, but um, 
these are the actual full names of the people and they are working at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. And so what they did was they basically removed added things to see what it was like added things that could destroy various um, biological molecules like proteins and lipids so like fatty things um, polysaccharides so sugars um, RNA DNA and only and then see what was actually able to um, prevent the transformation so they're going to be looking um, at agglutination so whether they um, it's going to react with these antibodies to the other type as well as at the um, as well as at the colony shape. And so they're going to be plating on LB agar. Um, so you might be familiar. Or, so they're going to be plating the things out on this blood agar to look for the colonies. So you might be familiar if, if you work in the lab. Um, like a biochemistry lab or molecular biology lab, you might be familiar with like LB agar plates. Um, so when we're talking about agar, this is like a sugary gel. Um, so we typically use these Petri dishes, so these little circular dishes, and we make this nice um, gel out of agar that's filled with bacteria food. And so we call bacteria food media. And typically the media we're using is LB, which is lysogeny broth. And so it's just kind of this generic um, bacteria food. They're using this blood agar um, which has, I think that this normally has like sheep blood or something in it, um, just to form to nutrients for the bacteria to grow. And you can see that this is an example. So this is the rough form, this R form, these little things. And this is this smooth um, S form. And because these are also different types, so this is coming, this RNA, this R form is derived from a pneumococcus type two. And then when it's in the transforming substance, when it's able to transform into this S form, this S form is type three. And so you you see these very um, dramatic differences in addition to the rough versus smooth appearance. You can easily tell them apart, as well as being able to tell them apart based on the agglutination. We'll get back into the later part of this figure before, but I think it's cool to be able to see the actual differences. Um, and this part's actually like hidden away in the supplementary. Um, it's like a figure after all, everything else at the end, um, but I thought it was really cool to see. So let's dive into this paper. So it was published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, so JEM in 1944. It's totally free to read, and so I hope you do. Um, and so what was possibly part of the reason it's not so greatly remembered is that it has this very long and unwieldy name, studies on the chemical nature of the substance inducing transformation of pneumococcal types, infection of transformation by a desoxyribonucleic acid fraction isolated from pneumococcus type three. Boom. So basically they're saying, okay, we're going, to, we're going after trying to figure out what that transforming substance is. And if you work in, um, we still call like transformation when we're putting genetic information into bacteria. And so this is like fits with that, that this is this like transforming principle transformation. Uh, but of course we didn't, they didn't know what they're actually transforming at this point, but they're figuring it out. Okay, so, and yeah, so they call DNA desoxyribonucleic acid. I'm not really sure why people used to say like desoxy and then it was changed to deoxy, um, but simpler to say um, deoxy, but I'll just go with DNA. Okay, so I had originally, when I first made this post, I had done it to kind of show people how by how scientific articles are laid out. Um, so I thought I'd just leave that in here. So how this article is laid out, basically it has this background and the background typically includes like what, what is and isn't known and how their experiment add more, adds more. So this present paper is concerned with the more detailed analysis of the phenomenon of transformation of specific types of pneumococcus. Um, and then they talk about uh, what other people had done. So they talk, they discuss Griffith's experiments, they discuss that sort of thing, as well as what was still um, unknown. And then they get to tell us about what they did, how they did it. Um, and so they have an experimental section, a really nice one, um, where they go into great detail about their methods these days. You typically find the methods are um, sending you to like as described in blah and then you go to that paper as described in the you go to that paper and then you end up reaching like a paywall or you reach this really really old paper that's not even um, digitized and so yeah so it's very nice when they have 
such nicely laid out experimental sections. And then they're going to do their discussion and then a conclusion and that sort of thing. So in terms of the experimental, what they're going to do is they're going to try to isolate the transforming substance and then figure out what it is. So in order to isolate it, they need to get it out of the bacteria cells. So basically they heat kill these cells and then they are going to extract this genetic information. And to do this, they need to break open the cells and to, um, they can do that. They add sodium disoxycholate, uh, which is the detergent, so like an artificial soap. And so it's able to kind of sneak in, wedge in between the lipidy membrane surrounding cells and help break them open. And then what they're able to, what they do is they use um, alcohol to precipitate the DNA. So they use ethanol, it's ethyl alcohol is the same as ethanol. You might have used ethanol to precipitate DNA in the lab, or if you did some sort of um, fruit DNA extraction. Basically, it's able to kind of help loosen up the water network around the DNA so it can like bind to salts and then precipitate out because it gets all neutralized. Um, don't have to worry about the details too much, just that's how um, it's they're precipitating out this DNA is the key thing. But that DNA might be contaminated by proteins or sugars. And so remember, they need to be super duper, make sure that they're purifying this as much as they can, because no one's going to believe them any, no matter what they do, but they want to get as, as pure as possible and really remove all the proteins and um, the polysaccharide, the capsular polysaccharide. So all of that um, stuff that was surrounding, so all of this S the S capsule that it makes, they need to um, remove all of that polysaccharide. And so what they're going to do is that basically they're adding things that they know destroy proteins and destroy polysaccharides. So they deprotonate it using chloroform. And so basically this is going to get the proteins um, to misfold and aggregate and all of this stuff. Um, and then they can reprecipitate out the DNA and then what they're going to do is they add something to chew up that um, the S caps that S, S capsule. Um, so they're not exactly sure what it is, but a purified preparation of a bacterial enzyme capable of hydrolyzing the type three capsule or probably saccharide. And then to make it even more sure, what they're going to do is they actually test it that it's actually totally destroyed by using an antibody against it to show that they really have removed all of that because that's really crucial is that they're removing all of the S capsule so that you can't say that it was something there that was actually transforming it. And then what they have to do is they have to destroy that protein that they just added. So they do deprotonation using that chloroform again. So they now have this um, pure substance and then they do even more alcohol fractionation to make it as pure as pure as possible. After all of this, they get 10 to 25 milligrams per 75 liters of culture. Wow, that's a lot of work for not a lot of stuff. Um, and so now they want to do as many tests as they can as possible on this transforming substance that they just isolated in this really pure form. So what are they going to do? Um, so various things, but one of them was that they, I analyzed this substance that they just purified to see what it was composed of element wise. So this like elementary chemical analysis. And what they did was, so they had these preparations, various preparations. And so I'm not sure why some of them don't have the carbon and hydrogen, but the important thing to focus on is the nitrogen and phosphorus. So DNA and protein both have nitrogen. But DNA also has phosphorus, whereas um, protein, unless a protein is like phosphorylated or something, basically it's not going to have, it's going to have very, very little phosphorus in it. Um, and those are only added through post like translational modifications. But you have this, this, you can know this like theoretical amount that you would expect of like nitrogen to phosphorus if you had pure, if you had pure um, DNA. And so they can tell that in their fractions, they have very close to this perfect ratio that they would expect. And if this was protein, they would, there were protein in there, they would have way, way, way less. So if there is a little bit of protein, it is not much of any. So now they wanted to see what it was um, that was actually doing this transforming. So it's one thing to say that it looks like DNA, but it's another thing to show that it's actually DNA in there that's doing the transforming. 
So this was the for the days of recombinant protein making. So with recombinant protein making, basically we take the instructions for a protein we want made, and then we stick it and we clone it into like a plasmid or something. So a piece of DNA that we can work with and we can stick that into cells and get those cells to make the protein for us. But this was way before those days. And so they couldn't do that. And so they didn't, weren't able to get like pure DNA. So DNA is something that chews up DNA. So they couldn't get pure DNAs that way, um, but they were able to treat it with various extracts and some of those contained DNAs is. So they took these various extracts. So you have dog intestinal mucosa, rabbit bone phosphatase. Um, so they had some of these, like um, they could get some enzymes purified from like other labs and various things, um, but these weren't like recombinant or anything. Um, swine kidney, phosphatase, pneumococcus autolysates, normal dog and rabbit serum, and they could test for enzymatic activity in di against different things. So phosphatase, could they remove phosphate groups? Um, Tributyrin esterase, so this is like able to chew up lipids, so like fats and oils. Um, then this, <laughs> their DNAs, I'm gonna use DNAs, but they call it depolymerase for deoxyribonucleate. Um, and so polymer, polymer, so DNA polymers, like DNA chain is like a polymer is just like repeating units or something. And so DNA, um, deoxy, DNA is like a polymer of these nucleotide, deoxyribonucleotide subunits. And so depolymerase would basically, they're saying that it removes the polymer form. So basically it's chewing up the DNA. And so you can see that what activity each of these different um, crude enzyme preparations has. And then you can see whether they have um, inactivation of the transforming principle. And so note that, this, yeah, so these are the crude enzyme preparations, so they're not like totally pure or anything, even the ones where they have identified an enzyme in it. But they see that when you have, so this is the one we want to look at, this DNA is now in hindsight, this is what we need to look at. Um, but basically you can see that if it doesn't have the DNA's activity, then you don't inactivate the transforming principle. But if you have this DNA's activity, you do uh, inactivate the transforming principle. So you prevent the, you are destroying whatever it was that was able to transform the R into the S. And it doesn't matter what else, what other activity they have, as long as they have that DNA's activity, then they're able to destroy the transforming principle. But is it, um, but is it actually that? I mean, there was other stuff in there. They don't have this pure DNAs. So how can we be sure that it's actually the DNAs, that activity that's actually important? And so the dog, they, they did this with some clever experiments using dog serum and rabbit serum. So both of these had transforming substance destroyers. So, but, so they both had DNAs, but these destroyers could be, and they could be killed by heat, but with different sensitivities. So the dog version was more sensitive. So it was killed at 60 degrees Celsius, whereas the rabbit form could survive at 60 degrees Celsius, but not at 65 degrees Celsius. So in this table, basically what they're doing is they are taking, so they have their R and they're mixing it with the, with the S, but then they're either add or not adding. So this is their control where they don't add any serum and then they add the serum with, from the dog or from the rabbit that's either unheated, heated at for, six, at, for 30 minutes at 60 degrees or heated at, for 30 minutes at 65 degrees Celsius. Basically the serum has the transformation killer. And so if we kill, if we don't kill that killer, then we're going to get no transformation. And so we're going to just see the R4. If we do kill the killer, then we're going to get transformation and we're going to see the S form. So if you don't kill, the, this is their control, so they don't add the serum and so they don't add any killer, they know they don't, and they're getting all of this in this S form. Now, if they add the dog serum or if they add the rabbit serum in its unheated form, so this is where you're not destroying the killer, now you can see that you only get this R form. What happens at 30 degrees, uh, at 60 degrees Celsius, so if they heat treat the serum at 60 degrees Celsius, now you're getting transformation of with the dog serum, but not with the rabbit serum. So that some the transformers destroyed in this dog serum at the 60 degrees, but not in this rabbit.
When you go up to 65 degrees Celsius, now the rabbit is killed as well. The rabbit um, transformer killer is killed, and so you get this transformation again. So there's this differential heat sensitivity of this transformer killer, but what actually is it that they are inactivating? Because this doesn't show that it's actually the DNA's activity that they're inactivating. To show that, what they did was they did this cool um, viscosity test. So basically, they took gloopy viscous DNA um, and looked for decreased, decreased viscosity as a measure of DNA's activity. So they took that same serum and they heated it at those same temperatures. But this time, instead of looking for transformation killing activity, they're looking for the ability to degloop the DNA. So basically, if you chew up all that gloopy DNA, it's going to be less viscous. And so if they don't heat this, they have this DNA's activity. And so they're able to um, reduce the viscosity very quickly. If you take the serum and you, and you heat it, however, if you heat it for at 60 degrees Celsius for the dog serum, you, you've already killed that activity. Whereas if you heat it for 60 degrees for at uh, 60 degrees for the rabbit serum, now you still have the polymerase activity. Um, but you don't, you lose most of it at 30 degrees or at 65 degrees, sorry. And this fits tracks just perfectly with the data from the previous slide. And yeah, so note that they call DNAs desoxyribonucleo depolymerase. So I'm glad we call it DNAs. But anyway, um, so yeah, so this fits perfectly. So they track the, the killing of the transformation killing tracks with the killing of the DNA's activity. So that's really, really important too. Then they did a titration of the transforming activity to figure out how far they could dilute the transforming substance until no R cells got converted. So they took this really pure substance and then they're saying, okay, so how much of it do we actually need? So they did this in quadruplicate. Duplicate. Um, and so above this point, all of these were positive. So the colonies got turned from, um, changed from the rough to the smooth form and the cells grew throughout the media. So they got this diffuse growth. Um, but, and at this solution level, only two replicates got transformed and below it none did. And what did this correspond to? This was, they only needed one part in 600 million. Um, so really, really, really tiny amounts were needed. And this was crucial too, because they had shown that there was, based on the DNA ratios, based on the tests with the various antibodies and stuff, they were able to show that there was barely, 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 barely any, if any, um, protein contamination or other contamination. And so the fact that you could, that you could dilute the, this transforming substance, which is at least like almost entirely DNA that far, imagine how, you're di how much you're diluting any of the contaminants. Um, and so this is also really crucial as showing that the thing that you don't need very much of this, um, and that this dilution, you would have basically removed any trace of any contaminant. So then they give a nice summary. Um, so basically they say that, but they, so they isolated this highly pure thing from heat killed bacteria, S bacteria that can transform our bacteria to the S form. And you can do it too. So basically they gave you the methods for isolating and purifying it because um, this hadn't been done before, but now other scientists can try it out. And um, point three, the really pure transforming thing really does act like DNA. It absorbs light like DNA does. I haven't gone into that, but it also, but they did some other characterization where they used some like ultra centrifugal filtration, ultra centrifuge um, analysis, analytical ultrafence. They did some other experiments that I didn't go into, but they did some like analytical um, centrifugation. So basically they spin the DNA in the gradients and see where it, um, where it lies. Um, they did various things like that. Um, so it has the same chemical makeup as we looked at. It isn't affected by chewers of other things. Um, and um, the next thing, so the changes that occur, the R to S change is predictable and, con and consistent and it's transmissible. The cells don't just change to any old type, they change to the thing that the transformer came from. Um, and then they tie up the things with the conclusion. Um, the evidence presented supports the belief that a nucleic acid of the desoxyribose type is the fundamental unit of the transforming principle of pneumococcus type three. Um, and then they have the references and stuff. Um, 
then it wasn't until, like I said, it wasn't until um, 1952 that these experiments, um, the Hershey Chase experiments, um, were done with the whole like blender phage stuff. Um, and I have a post on that as well. Um, but this is, these Hershey Chase experiments are typically cited when people talk about showing that DNA was a transforming principle. Um, but Avery McLeod and McCarty's experiments really were, um, well, transformative. <laughs> 